So thanks very much, Tony, for agreeing to chat with me today. We'd have, we've had a couple of opportunities in the past informally as colleagues to sure. interact, um, but it's nice to have an opportunity to really focus the discussion um, and share it with others. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you the question about what was it that um, initially drew you or has continued to draw you to the issue of civic engagement in higher education? Well, I suppose it's a slightly convoluted route. Um, for a period of time I worked with two colleagues, one in Queens, one in Ulster, uh, one in social policy, one in sociology, and I was coming from an education background. And we did uh, work on the education system in Northern Ireland, looking at uh, some issues around funding and outcomes and equity issues. Uh, we did quite a lot of work on that. Uh, they had been previously doing work on patterns of participation and access to higher education in Northern Ireland, and so I joined them on the later versions of that work. Um, and that turned out to be quite influential for, uh, as provided most of the, the evidence base for a big review of higher education in the UK as a whole, um, and helped to contribute a lot of discussions we paid around the expansion of higher education and the introduction of fees. Uh, although our interest was in uh, class and religious patterns of participation in the index. As a consequence of that, uh, I was invited to join a project being run by the Council of Europe around the idea of universities as of, sites of citizenship. Um, this was the first project they had run on this. They were they had linked up with some American colleagues who um, had rediscovered the land grant tradition of American universities where back in the, in the period after the Civil War, some universities were given uh, endowments of land by the federal government on condition that they uh, engaged in some work that was of particular value to, to the community. Um, that tradition has sort of got lost, and some of these, some of these American universities have rediscovered that mission and put it into a 20th century context. And we're starting to look at the related, particularly universities based in urban centres, what responsibility they had, they had for the urban community around them. Um, and the Council of Europe was interested in this work because they um, they were working in post-communist societies and saw universities as potential places that could help to build and underpin democratic culture in, in the new, newly emerging democracies. But the starting point for the Council was to try and find some case studies of universities across Europe to see the extent to which universities were doing anything like this. Um, and it was an element of serendipity that uh, Queen's uh, was identified as, uh, as a potential uh, sort of sample case study in this, this project and it was an even greater act of serendipity that I happened to be asked to go and look after it because somebody else had originally tagged it and then at the last minute had to drop out um, and whenever they looked at some, some of the things that were happening here at the time because of the, the conflict and the relationship between university and society and lots of issues around participation access and all the things um, the council were quite pleasantly surprised at the extent of which Queens was so well connected with the local community. Um, the, and so that fire, that's one of the things that, that effectively appeared to be ahead of the game compared to a lot of our European uh, European colleagues. Uh, struck me as really interesting. Uh, for a whole variety of reasons, changes of personnel and all sorts of other things, there was a gap in the council's work. They stopped doing it for a while, but I kept my contacts, really phone contacts with the American um, uh, colleagues and still stay involved with some of their work. I mean, whenever the council, uh, council uh, returned to this as an area of interest um, and picked up again on the American contacts, I was sort of brought back into the process. And I've been working with them now, I guess, for, I suppose, about 10 years on a lot of these issues. Um, and uh, I'm now part of the State Committee of the International Consortium, who's trying to promote the, promote the sort of work I did a lot of work within Queen's to try and institutionalise it, which was successful to a degree. Um, so it, it still remains now the sort of the second main plank of my core research interests. Right. So that's how it all happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mixture of serendipity and... Absolutely. Well, uh, I mean, that's often what happens in these situations that uh, you sometimes find yourself in a situation where a couple of things just sort of come together by accident um, and an opportunity 
presents itself, and the question is whether or not you're prepared to, to run with the opportunity when it's there. And if you do and it works, then that's great. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think the issue of civic engagement is important for higher education at this point in time? Well, I suppose if you look at the history of higher education, it, it used to, it still is an element of an elite experience, um, but it used to be an awful lot more elite. Whenever I was a student in Queens and Belfast, it was maybe 10 or 11 percent of 18 year olds got to university. Currently, it's closer to 50 percent. Um, the, uh, the entire culture of higher education uh, ought to change with that sort of process of massification. Um, the, uh, uh, I suppose, the stereotype of the university is of the MTR, the place that's set apart from ordinary everyday life, the place where people can go and spend their time thinking about things and writing about things unencumbered by uh, problems of the moment. Um, and that traditional image has changed over time. If you think our primary role is around knowledge, there was a time whenever universities primarily thought that they produced knowledge for themselves and that was their, their role. Uh, eventually they came to realise that there was value in sharing that knowledge with people outside of the academy. That happened for a while. A later stage in the development of this process, I suppose, was the development of knowledge partnerships and knowledge exchange, recognising that communities outside the university had knowledge that was also useful and engaged in that patterns of exchange. But I think where, where we are now um, uh, is a, a period whenever it's not just the communities outside the institution of knowledge that is worth us knowing about, but Communities outside the university have a key role in helping us to understand better the issues we're trying to deal with. So you're moving beyond exchange of knowledge and information and into a period of real partnership. Um, and if you think about it, a lot of the research agendas that we engage with um, within the institution itself, we're not necessarily directly affected by them. Um, so a much better way of trying to understand the issues that are important is to engage with people who are, uh, because they can help us better understand what the key issues actually are and help us to better understand some of the data that we find and some of the, uh, the things we're trying to analyze and, and work with. So that idea of partnership is where a lot of this comes from. Um, and obviously there are many communities that already have a partnership with higher education institutions uh, because of their own position within society. Uh, so the next step for me is to say, okay, well, if partnership is so important and if we're interested in a whole range of social issues, how about the people out there that we don't partner with? And why is it we don't partner with them? Why is it they're, they're not represented in the institution? And so from a social justice perspective, I think you need to take that extra step, which is to, um, to go out and engage with communities that normally are not seen in institutions. Because a lot of the stuff that we try to research is is issues that uh, impact those people. Mm -hmm. So there's all of that. Um, then there's a, a sort of separate element that higher education institutions receive a lot of public money and with that comes a degree of civic responsibility. Um, that we are not just there to soak up money from society and do things, in, no matter how interesting they are, we have a responsibility to engage with society in some way to try and help to um, improve the the, the, the common good improves it or common lot. So I think we, we have that sense of civic responsibility and that's what, for me, is personally is one of the key drivers in this, that mm -hmm. the um, uh, partnership isn't something that we do just because it's a good thing to do, it's something we do because it's the right thing to do. Sure. sure. What do you think of some of the, I mean, there may be people out here who are listening, some may be students, some may be fellow colleagues. Um, what do you think are some of the gaps to address, either through research or through practice in higher education, in terms of civic engagement? Yeah, well, if you, if you take this notion of civic engagement, or public engagement, which is the terminology used more often in the UK context, it's, it should affect everything that we do. It's important for research because it's about ensuring that whenever we're identifying research, particular research issues or particular problems, we are working with others to try and understand what are the key issues, what are the key agendas. And we're working with others to try and help us understand the data that we collect. Um, the, uh, uh, so that's one element. It helps us to do research better. I think there's no doubt about that. It helps us to do research that is much more likely to have some sort of a social impact. Um, it should impact on the, the teaching that we do. 
um, in a number of different respects. Same sort of issue, it's worth doing teaching in communities and with communities so that we have a better sense of what's going on. There's a value in experiential learning for our students. There's also a value for our students in uh, experiencing the, the life of other communities in the wider society um, and giving them a sense of personal civic responsibility. Part of the reason why all of this gathered momentum in the United States was because so many young people were involved in it. Um, and this wasn't being addressed in schools, or rather what was being addressed in schools was uh, sort of instrumental activities around uh, promoting a sense of patriotism, um, but not giving, particularly giving young people a sense of why it was important that they engage as active citizens. And so universities who were in this space started to take that on as a sort of key issue. That also was one of the issues that the Council of Europe was interested in, because many graduates would want to become leaders in society and all other different sort of aspects. And so they were interested in trying to promote a sense of democratic culture. That then leads you into the structure of the institution itself and how the institution sets its own priorities and the extent to which that reflects aspects of democratic culture. And one of the advantages we have in Europe compared to the United States is there's a strong tradition in many European countries of strong student unions, where the students elect their own representatives, they have their own structure to support those representatives and they play a part in the governance of the institution, that's all very good and that should be strengthened. Um, the uh, part of the process of learning um, uh, with education agenda can be about those sorts of and there's the content of what they learn, but there's also the implicit messages about the relationship with society that's involved within that and the importance of listening to people and engaging with people. Um, if you want to understand social problems, then you need to do it in a way that not only is working with the people who are trying to address those social problems on a day and daily basis, but, but listen very carefully to their perspective on because that helps to inform your understanding and the rest of it. Um, the fact that we're big institutions, we employ large numbers of people, we should be exemplar employers in terms of the way we, um, uh, we run, uh, we provide job opportunities and all this, this sort of thing. Um, we have large bodies of expertise among our academic and professional staff. We should be looking for opportunities to encourage volunteering and other outreach activity by the staff as part of their contribution back to the institution. So there's a whole host of ways. Um, that uh, we can do this. And one of the other reasons why it's so important for universities to, to do it is because we are, in many senses, anchor institutions. The fact that we are in a place is important. We have some core relationship with that place. It's part of who we are, it's part of our history. Um, very few universities ever lift up and relocate somewhere. Uh, very few universities ever close down. Um, the, uh, uh, so they, they have that sort of anchor status which gives them an extra, an extra level of civic place that's important as well. So there's a whole sort of host of reasons yeah. there. Uh, and it's to do with our research, it's to do with our teaching, it's to do with the way we run ourselves and the example we provide for people in the institution, institution and people outside. And it's to do with just the fact that we are a large organisation that uh, it provide an important civic role within society itself. And so we should do that well. Mm. And we should do it in a way that reflects the sort of values that we think are important. I mean, I think it's been very helpful for you to identify a couple of focal points, as sort of places where these could be enacted. Yeah. Um, what are the issues that continue to perplex you as maybe as a researcher instead of as a practitioner? Well, the, um, but it, there's still, it's, it's less an argument now, it was an argument at one point among many academics that uh, this whole issue about impact uh, and about um, uh, making an impact on society was um, too utilitarian. We should be just given grant or something uh, to do stuff and we should be just allowed to do it and we should not be accountable to anyone because that's the way of guaranteeing academic freedom. Uh, that was an argument that you know that has its attractions but it was sort of it was for me it was harking back to the every tower idea. That we should just be allowed to get on for what we're doing, regardless of whether it's a value to anyone else. Mm. Um, I don't think, um, I think the autonomy of universities is very important. So we, we, uh, we shouldn't simply be directed by government or other big agencies like that. Uh, so there's a balance to be struck there. Um, and that's an issue which mm. is probably, there's probably a constant tension there, but that's okay. Uh, because if there's attention, something means you keep thinking about it and talking about it and trying to work out what's the best way to, to do things. So that's that's sort of one, one area. 
Um, I suppose another frustration within the institutions is the um, uh, the pressure for uh, well, the pressure to, to, that we are seen as um, key contributors to economic policy. It is important. I mean, one of the, one of the things that universities do is provide all of our students the qualifications, attributes, and the rest of it that allows them to go on and live uh, fulfilled lives as citizens. Um, uh, the employability aspect for each individual is very, very important. Um, the uh, universities help to enhance the, the skills space of society, and that's important. Um, we work with industry and business, uh, and that helps to create jobs and economic growth, and all of that's important. The problem comes whenever that's the only thing that seems to be important, um, and that we're seeing that as economic units. Um, in fact, if you look, uh, particularly in, in European context, probably one of the ways most universities do interact with society is through uh, economic regeneration programs. There's a lot of universities work very closely in, particularly in the urban settings around regeneration strategies. Um, and uh, part of the reason that that happens is because government policy on economic policy tends to be much, much more clearly defined. Uh, it's easier for universities to slot themselves into those sorts of uh, situations. The, the, the plans generally are medium to long term. There is high levels of investment associated. So it's easy to slot yourself into that type of activity. And for lots of colleagues to see this as a natural extension of what, what they're doing. By contrast, the sort of the social or cultural agendas tend to be much more short term, uh, much smaller amounts of investment, uh, much looser short term money. Um, so it's harder. It's harder to see. Sometimes, particularly if institutions are under pressure, it's harder to convince the institutional leadership that this is something that's important to do because there's other things that are important and look an awful lot easier to do and look an awful lot more profitable, if you like, in the shorter term. Uh, so there's sort of two pressures: the pressure of sort of of sort of retreating back into the every tower, or the pressure of jumping out into society and seeing yourself simply as like a business. Mm -hmm. uh, two very, very different pressures, but uh, both dragging you, dragging you away from the place where I think you really want to be. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Um, and hopefully at another time we can engage about these issues. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>